Here, the Democratic Unionist Party has accused the Prime Minister of breaking a promise that she would never sign up to a Brexit deal that treats Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. The party has been angered by a letter to its leader, Arlene Foster, from Theresa May, which has been seen by the Times newspaper. It focuses on one of the main sticking points in the negotiations, namely how to avoid a hard Irish border after Brexit and what's called the backstop arrangement. Our reality check correspondent Chris Morris explains what that is. The Brexit debate has an awful lot to do with lines on the map. And what negotiators call the backstop is a guarantee that after Brexit, there will be no hard border, no new border checks between the Republic of Ireland in the EU and Northern Ireland in the UK under all circumstances. Keeping the border open is a crucial part of the Northern Ireland peace process and both sides hope a new trade agreement can keep everything running as smoothly as it does now. But if they can't do that deal or it's not ready in time, the backstop would kick in automatically. So to recap, as Chris was explaining there, the backstop is an insurance policy designed to maintain an open border on the island of Ireland in the event the UK leaves the EU without that all-encompassing deal. Now, as you'll know, there's also what's called the backstop to the backstop. And let's explain what that is. Well, that is what the EU has proposed if the backstop agreement itself cannot be made in time. And it would mean that Northern Ireland would stay within the EU's custom arrangements, therefore creating a customs border in the Irish Sea. What has particularly frustrated the DUP is the Prime Minister's mention of this in her letter to Arlene Foster. Uh, in it, she says, let's have a look at uh, the paragraph which is causing lots of consternation. I'm clear that I could not accept there being any circumstances or conditions in which that backstop to the backstop which would break up the UK customs territory could come into force. Well, let's explore all of this further with our political correspondent, Leila Nathu, who joins us from Westminster. Morning to you, Leila. Uh, these Brexit discussions have been littered with examples of how statements have been interpreted in, in different ways. So in this instance, why is the DUP saying that a promise has been broken? Well, I think this is a reminder of just how many fronts there are where negotiations are taking place. So not only are there negotiations taking place between the UK and Brussels, there are also negotiations between the, the Conservative government and the DUP and within the government itself. But this point of contention, as you say, relates to this insurance policy, the idea of keeping the Irish border open, free from checks under any circumstances. Now, the sticking point between the UK and Brussels has been that Theresa May wants there to be a time limit on that insurance policy so it could expire at any point. And Brussels says, well, look, if it's an insurance policy that comes to an end and you can decide when that comes to an end, it's not an insurance policy at all. So they want something, this backstop to a backstop, that basically ensures that under all circumstances there is still a fallback option for the Irish border. Now, Theresa May is saying that this is the, in this letter, she's explaining the EU's proposals uh, to the DUP, saying this is what they want. But it is that turn of phrase saying that this is not, not something that would ever come into force that has raised their eyebrows because it means that this idea of the EU's preferred fallback option, which would separate off Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK in customs terms, that is the concern is on the DUP side going to be written in to the withdrawal agreement, the divorce deal that's being hammered out and is nearly at its final stages. So that is what is concerning the DUP and they are saying to Theresa May that this is a broken promise. Now this is something that Downing Street denies saying look we are clear that we would never countenance anything that creates a customs border down at the Irish Sea and the Attorney General, uh, the former Attorney General now Culture Secretary Jeremy Wright said this morning there had been no change in position. What we've said throughout this process and what we are still saying is that we will not accept an arrangement where there's a border down the Irish Sea. That's the concern that the DUP have. We have had that proposal from the European Union, but I don't think the Prime Minister could have been any clearer and remains clear that that isn't an acceptable proposal to the United Kingdom. That remains the case. 
So as the negotiations enter their final stage, but they're still not quite done, you'll see this lobbying uh, from the DUP raising uh, their concerns. But remember, there are still no agreement on many of these points within the Cabinet, and we are expecting a Cabinet meeting early next week to t try and thrash out some of these final points. OK, Leila, thank you very much. Leila Nathu in Westminster. And let's talk now to John Campbell, BBC Northern Ireland's economics and business editor, joining us from Belfast. Morning to you as well, John. Uh, bring us up to date with what the DUP have been saying about this in a bit more detail. Yeah, I, mean, I don't really want to contradict what my colleagues have been saying, but it's not the customs thing which is annoying the DUP today. In that letter they have from the Prime Minister, she again repeats that she doesn't want to do anything which would break up the customs union. She gives that firm assurance to the DUP, and the DUP accept that. But what she does do in her letter is leaves open the possibility that Northern Ireland, in a backstop situation, would have to continue to follow many of the rules of the EU's single market. So it's not to do with customs, it's to do with single market regulations. That's what's annoying the DUP today. The Prime Minister in her letter says, well, listen, Northern Ireland is already different from the rest of the UK in some regulations. For example, if you want to bring animals into Northern Ireland from Great Britain, they all need to be checked. They need to have paperwork. So she suggests that in a, a backstop situation, that could be expanded upon. But the DUP are not wearing that at all. They say the current regulatory divergence between the UK and Northern Ireland has been democratically agreed. If you implemented this form of backstop, those new regulations, that new divergence, would be imposed by Brussels would be fundamentally undemocratic and would start to break up the UK. That's what's concerning them today, not customs. It illustrates, doesn't it, John, how uh, tricky it is to get to the nitty-gritty of the detail uh, in all of this. And uh, looking earlier at what Sammy Wilson, the DUP's Brexit spokesman, w was saying, he feels that, uh, as things stand, the DU DUP couldn't possibly back Theresa May on any deal on this basis. Exactly, yeah. The, the, the DUP's 10 MPs would not back a withdrawal agreement which would leave open the possibility that Northern Ireland would continue to follow those single market rules but the rest of the UK would not. And interestingly this morning Dominic Grieve, the former Attorney General who's a, a, a Remain supporter, he's in Northern Ireland, we spoke to him and he said that he couldn't support that sort of backstop either and he thinks many, many Conservative MPs couldn't support it. So while the DUP I think have accepted that Theresa May is going for a sort of deal which would involve some element of a Northern Ireland specific backstop, they still believe that she will struggle to get that through Parliament. Okay, John, thank you very much. John Campbell in Belfast. Now, the Democratic Unionist Party has accused the Prime Minister of breaking a promise that she would never sign up to a Brexit deal that treats Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. The party has been angered by a letter to its leader, Arlene Foster, from Theresa May, which has been seen by the Times newspaper. It focuses on one of the main sticking points in the negotiations, how to avoid a hard Irish border after Brexit, and what's called the backstop arrangement. Our reality check correspondent, Chris Morris, explains what that is. The Brexit debate has an awful lot to do with lines on the map. And what negotiators call the backstop is a guarantee that after Brexit, there will be no hard border, no new border checks between the Republic of Ireland in the EU and Northern Ireland in the UK under all circumstances. Keeping the border open is a crucial part of the Northern Ireland peace process, and both sides hope a new trade agreement can keep everything running as smoothly as it does now. But if they can't do that deal or it's not ready in time, the backstop would kick in automatically. So as Chris was explaining there, the backstop is an insurance policy designed to maintain an open border on the island of Ireland in the event the UK leaves the EU without an all-encompassing deal. Uh, there's also what's called the backstop to the backstop. Now that is what the EU has proposed if a backstop agreement can't be made in time. And it would mean that Northern Ireland would stay within the EU's custom arrangements, therefore creating a customs border in the Irish Sea. What has particularly uh, frustrated the DUP is the Prime Minister's mention of this in her letter to Arlene Foster. Now let's uh, take a look at that. Uh, in it, she writes, I am clear that I could not accept there being any circumstances or conditions uh, in which that backstop to the backstop 
which would break up the UK customs territory could come into force. Now, just before we discuss this further, uh, there's just been uh, a comment from the Chancellor Philip Hammond on all of this saying uh, the government will not do anything that would threaten the union but he didn't directly answer the question about whether a Northern Ireland only backstop would feature in the Brexit withdrawal agreement. Uh, asked if he was prepared to rule out a Northern Ireland only backstop being included in the withdrawal agreement, the Chancellor said, we have always said that we can't accept the Commission proposal for a Northern Ireland specific solution because we are unionists and we won't agree anything that puts our union at risk. So let's uh, talk about all of this with our political correspondent Leila Nathu who joins us from Westminster. Uh, so Leila, just break down for us what specifically uh, it, it, the DUP's concerns are with this letter from Theresa May. Well, Anita, this is all about what is going to be included in that crucial text, the divorce deal, the withdrawal agreement that is nearly there. The Prime Minister says it's 95% of the way there. And what is holding it up is this insurance policy uh, to keep the Irish border free from checks. Now, there are two proposals for that insurance policy. Uh, the the EU's proposal is for Northern Ireland to be treated differently from the rest of the UK, to stay in the EU customs union. Theresa May's proposal is to say, well, Northern Ireland cannot be treated differently from the rest of the UK. We will, our insurance policy will be a UK-wide customs union. And she wants that proposal to ensure that the EU's version would never come into force at all. But the DUP are now suspicious because they have read the text of her letter as and interpreted that as suggesting that the EU's proposal could still be written into this legally binding text that is being hammered out between the UK and Brussels. The DUP's Sammy Wilson said it would be a breach of trust to hive off Northern Ireland from the rest of UK. We want to trust the Prime Minister because she has said so many times that that is the case. But, but you have to judge any promise by what is actually delivered uh, in an agreement. And from what we can see in the letter which has been sent to Arlene and Nigel, it is quite clear that some of the promises which are made do not conform to some of the content of the letter which has been written. So you can see there is a lot of suspicion still on the part of the DUP who, remember, prop up Theresa May's government. Uh, she relies on them for their votes. And remember, the withdrawal agreement, any agreement that is reached with Brussels, will have to go through Parliament and be approved there. So their votes will be crucial. Now, they're very clear that they cannot countenance anything uh, that would uh, separate off Northern Ireland, put a customs border effectively in the Irish Sea. But the government maintains that that is not something that they are considering, that their proposal for this UK-wide insurance policy should ensure that that is never even countenanced. But there is still a lot of debate between the UK and Brussels. That is the main sticking point in the negotiations. Uh, but today, the Culture Secretary, Jeremy Wright, insisted there had been no change of position. What we've said throughout this process and what we are still saying is that we will not accept an arrangement where there's a border down the Irish Sea. That's the concern that the DUP have. We have had that proposal from the European Union, but I don't think the Prime Minister could have been any clearer and remains clear that that isn't an acceptable proposal to the United Kingdom. That remains the case. So this issue off this insurance policy to keep the Irish border free from checks is now the main issue holding up the negotiations both uh, with, with Brussels, between the UK and Brussels, and within the Cabinet, because not all ministers are signed up to that. We are expecting a special Cabinet meeting sometime early next week when ministers are hopefully expected to sign off uh, any proposal. OK, uh, Leila, thank you very much. And uh, staying with this, because in the last few minutes, we've also heard from the pro-Remain Conservative MP and former Attorney General Dominic Grieve on the issue of an Irish border post-Brexit. Once you start saying that you are going to have a different regulatory regime, which could include tariffs, uh, could also include all sorts of regulatory elements, then you would have to have essentially a hard border in the Irish Sea. And I don't see that compatible with Northern Ireland's status within the United Kingdom. To that extent, I understand the DUP's position entirely. And the interesting thing is that I think at Westminster, 
it's very likely that you will find a very large number of Conservative members of Parliament and indeed members of other political parties who would refuse as a matter of principle to sign up to such an arrangement. Dominic Grieve. There's only so we're pulling away from that because we're going to go to the British Irish, Irish Council in the Isle of Man. David Liddington is speaking. The commitments that were made in the joint report of December 2017, and that means you know, all the various commitments that were made in that joint report. Um, and the Prime Minister has always been very clear that you know, we don't, uh, won't accept something that involves sort of carving out Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom. Sorry, well, well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here in, in the Isle of Man. Um, Majin Maya good. Is that right? Majin Maya? Oh, Borrow Maya. Borrow yeah. Banks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, is very similar to Irish. Borrow <laughs> <laughs> Maya, Mur okay, <laughs> almost, almost right. Um, and just, just before I answer the question, just, just briefly to acknowledge, of course, that the British Irish Council is, is a Good Friday Agreement institution, so it's even though all parts of the Good Friday Agreement may not be operating at the moment, uh, this aspect of it is. <coughs> Uh, and the um, authors of the Good Friday Agreement 20 years ago um, could not have foreseen all that would take place uh, in the 20 years that followed, but they were very far-seeing. Uh, and more and more I realised the extent to which they recognised that there was a totality of relationships uh, in this part of the world uh, between uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland, between Ireland and the UK, but also involving all seven jurisdictions uh, and, and all five islands. And this is a very uh, valuable, I think, uh, expression of that totality of relationships. I had a chance to speak today, obviously, about Northern Ireland and everyone's desire to have the um, Executive and Assembly uh, functioning again on Brexit as well, uh, and uh, the progress being made in those negotiations, uh, and also the issue of digital inclusion, which our ministers, including Minister Say Kenny, uh, were involved in discussing last night and this morning. Uh, in terms of the, the backstop, what is uh, envisaged is that it would be there as a protocol to the withdrawal agreement. Uh, but I think when we talk about the backstop, we should always recall what the objective is. Uh, and the most important thing for me is the objective, uh, and that is to uh, give everyone uh, in Northern Ireland and Ireland the uh, assurance that a hard border will not develop between North and South, no matter what else uh, may happen in, in the years ahead. Uh, and that is why we're seeking one that is legally operative uh, and one that uh, gives us that guarantee that is necessary. Uh, I think we are at a sensitive point in the negotiations. Um, a successful outcome is not guaranteed, uh, but uh, I think it is possible in the next couple of weeks, and probably with that in mind, uh, the less said the better about the, the detail of that. Uh, a question to uh, Shock, um, Cabinet, from the Cabinet, uh, Cabinet Office Minister. And, uh, sorry, could you state who you represent? Oh, sorry, James Williams, BBC Wales. Um, to start with, um, Dominic Grant, the Brexit Secretary, uh, said this week that he wasn't aware initially of the importance of the Dover-Calais route. Are you as a Taoiseach aware of the importance of the Dublin-Hollyhead route? And are you concerned that how these negotiations are going and the potential breakdown, that that could have a big impact on, on that route? Also, on, you know, the, the big question now is about the detail of trying to avoid a, avoid a hard border in Ireland. Unless something gives here, we're potentially looking at a no-deal Brexit, but of course it's potentially going to lead to a hard border on, in, on Ireland. So does, do both sides need to, to give something here? Uh, to the Cabinet Office Minister, I want to ask about a statement made by the uh, First Minister uh, today. He's laying the blame of uh, Schaffler, the German automobile uh, decision earlier this week to close a plant in uh, Feneschi. Firmly at your feet saying that it's your shambolic handling of the Brexit negotiations that is to blame for that. So could I have a response on that? And then, First Minister, if you could elaborate on that point. Well, okay. I, I think I might take the first one as you asked me first. Um, yes, very much aware of the importance of the Dublin uh, Hollyhead link. Uh, have had the pleasure to be Minister for Transport for three and a half years in Ireland, so Dublin Port fell under my remit and uh, had the chance to visit and see those operations uh, on, on many occasions. And it's not just the importance of the Dublin Hollyhead link, it's also the land bridge through the UK. Uh, a huge amount of our trade uh, with uh, continental Europe goes through Hollyhead and uh, then on from Dover through, through Calais. Um, there are ways around. Uh, by boat to Rotterdam and Antwerp um, and to France, but much slower. 
uh, and also very aware that a huge amount of trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain was through Dublin Port uh, because the quick way to get to the south of England is through Dublin, not, not through uh, Larne or Stranraer, as you can imagine, and that's a very important uh, link as well. So um, my objective when it comes to trade is to uh, do everything we can to avoid the emergence of any new uh, borders among any of us. Uh, and that's what the European Union gave us, which was uh, border-free trade uh, between Britain and, and Ireland and all of the European Union. Um, the fact that Brexit is happening makes that difficult to replicate, but our objective certainly as an Irish government uh, is to do that uh, if we can, to the extent that we can, in order to allow people to travel freely as they have been for so long now, but also to allow trade to function as it does now. I, on, um, I might echo what the Taoiseach said about the importance of those trade routes. If you look at, um, I mean, the, the, the north-south trade on the island of Ireland is clearly important. It, it's important to the way in which a lot of small businesses in particular operate, a lot of uh, agri-food businesses on the island operate, um, and it has massive um, political and symbolic significance as well as anybody who sat down with people in Derry, Londonderry or Newry or Dundalk will testify. But in pure economic terms, the east-west trade between both Northern Ireland and GB and uh, Ireland and GB is far more important than the, the value of the trade that moves north-south across the jurisdictional border. So that, to my mind, <laughs> reinforces the fact that it is in the interests of everybody in these islands that we get both uh, an agreement on uh, the withdrawal deal, uh, which gives the certainty of the implementation period, uh, and at the same time a political declaration about uh, the future partnership, and a future partnership where um, the EU27 as well as the United Kingdom uh, accept and work towards the objective of frictionless trade between our respective jurisdictions. That is the thing that will work best for businesses, for living standards of prosperity um, in every, every part of um, the island of Ireland, every part of the United Kingdom, for that matter, I think, in the Crown Dependencies as well. Um, on the particular question that you asked about um, the company in Italy, um, it's difficult for me to, you know, I don't know the details of that company's operations to, to comment on that. Um, and uh, different companies at different times find that market conditions are affecting them. A number of uh, automotive companies at the moment are finding that, that sales, more generally, the demand in the market is not what they had uh, expected it to, to be. Um, but at the same time, you look at the, um, the, the pattern of inward investment into the United Kingdom, and in the last year, we were still attracting uh, more uh, third country inward investment to the UK than uh, any other member state of the European Union. So I think that the, the track record shows that um, our uh, attractiveness as a destination for third country inward investment remains very powerful indeed. Now, I'm absolutely convinced that one of the benefits of uh, uh, a successful outcome to the current negotiations would be a reinforcement of that position. And that is a reason, again, why I think it's in the interest of everybody in the United Kingdom that we get uh, an early and comprehensive resolution of uh, those negotiations so that we can move on and construct the sort of deep and special future partnership that I think is in the interest of all countries involved. Can I guess this or just English? We'll, we'll speak later. Okay. Uh, well, in terms of Schaeffler, those are not my words, they're their words. Uh, they've said that Brexit is uh, one of the major issues that's caused them to look to uh, close uh, the plant in, uh, in Llanelli. It emphasises to me the need to get certainty as quickly as possible. Uh, David and I have discussed this this morning, uh, along with, with, with First Minister Scotland, uh, and uh, we all understand that uh, business needs certainty more than anything else. Uh, and I hope over the next uh, few weeks we will get that certainty. So business feels that they are now operating in a situation uh, where they can see the future, because at the moment uh, it's very difficult for them. Since, since the summer particularly, 
uh, they become concerned that there might be a no deal, uh, and as a result of that, they've started taking decisions that are not uh, good decisions as far as we are concerned, and Schaeffler is, of course, an example of that. I think on the issue of the hard border, I well understand, of course, um, the issues surrounding the border on the island of Ireland, but it's important to avoid a hard border between Ireland and the UK. The last thing I'd want to see is a hard border between Ireland and Wales. 70% of trade between GB and Ireland goes through the Welsh ports. If there is extra bureaucracy, um, extra checks at the Welsh ports, uh, that will have an effect on the ports themselves and of course on the road structure leading into the ports, both of which are devolved. Uh, we run the ports, we run the roads, uh, there is a danger that if we had a hard Brexit uh, with no deal, for example, uh, that we would end up having to pay uh, a huge amount of money uh, on the port and on the roads in order to accommodate the, uh, the, the traffic that would be delayed there as a result of, of uh, any imposition of extra controls. So it's hugely important for us in Wales to avoid that as well. So a hard border, of course, we want to see that avoided in Ireland, but we also want to see it avoided in the sea as well. I hear what David says, of course, about um, the avoiding a hard border down the Irish Sea. That applies uh, as much to Wales as it does to, uh, to anywhere else. The last thing I'd want to see is a situation created where uh, freight moved through the ports of Northern Ireland, uh, we have no direct link with Northern Ireland, of course, because the Welsh ports were seen as more problematic. That clearly would have an effect on trade and our jobs. Thank you. Lady on the second row, and then Adrian. Wondering, um, do you think that that letter from Theresa May now potentially leaves the way open for regulatory checks on goods between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK? And do you think that maybe, or do you think maybe this is Theresa May simply reinforcing that any backstop has to be time limited? And given the response of the DUP so far to that letter, how much damage do you think that this potentially does to being able to reach a deal at all? Uh, well, I, I suppose you're, you're asking me about uh, correspondence between Prime Minister May and the DUP, and um, I, I'm a third party in, in that particular conversation, so it's probably best for me not, not to speak on behalf either of the Prime Minister or the DUP, that they're very much able to speak for, uh, speak for themselves. Um, but I do think when it comes to uh, Northern Ireland, uh, it's very important to listen to and have regard to what the DUP has to say. Uh, but there are other political parties as well uh, who represent um, the majority of people in Northern Ireland uh, and there's also Northern Ireland business and Northern Ireland farmers and people who live in Northern Ireland uh, and I think we really have to have regard to uh, that as well uh, in coming to any conclusions uh, and certainly uh, you know the position of the Irish government uh, ha has always been that we don't want to see any new borders uh, between us uh, and that applies uh, as much between um, Larne and Stranraer or between uh, Belfast and London as it does between uh, Newry and Dundalk or, 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 or Derry and Londonderry. We're not the ones here who are seeking uh, any borders or any new checks of, of any sort, um, but Brexit has given risen to a difficult situation uh, and we need to resolve that. Adrian. Adrian, to my newspaper says the question for um, Howard Post, who's the Minister of the and uh, the First Minister of Scotland. What are your thoughts on how Brexit will impact on relations between um, Ireland, uh, Scotland, Wales and the Crown dependencies in whatever form that is? And how confident are you that we will get a deal and how soon? Right, well I'll kick that one off. First, obviously the benefit and the beauty of the British Irish Council is that the Isle of Man can have good working relationships with Ireland Scotland, Wales and, and the rest of our, of our colleagues, it's really important, it gives us an opportunity to raise the, the concerns that we have. The Isle of Man is in the middle of the Irish Sea, our closest neighbours are geographically Ireland, Scotland <laughs> and, and, and Wales, so we are obviously concerned but I think the sooner the better that an agreement can be reached, uh, I suppose the definition of what a good agreement will be, we can all have various viewpoints on but this organisation is, is key, certainly from an Isle of Man point of view, to ensuring that we are well represented. Uh, well, firstly, on uh, the, the last part of your question, how likely do I think it is that there will be a deal? I'm not uh, party to these negotiations. Uh, clearly, the next few days are going to be 
uh, critical and we will require to wait and see uh, what transpires. I think one of the issues uh, that still uh, dogs these talks is that the United Kingdom government appears to be still in a process of shooting uh, amongst itself rather than so we are having some problems just as we began to listen to Nicola Sturgeon there. Uh, we're going to see if the line comes good and we can continue to listen uh, to what the participants in the British Irish Council uh, meeting being held in the Isle of Man are saying. But uh, just to bring you through a few of the key lines, David Liddington effectively, uh, Theresa May's deputy, uh, talking about that leaked letter uh, from Theresa May to the DUP, leaked to the Times newspaper. Uh, he was saying we won't accept anything that could uh, carve Northern Ireland out from the rest of the UK. Uh, Leo Varadkar, the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, saying when we talk about a backstop, we should always think about the objective, that being no hard border uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. He said we are seeking one that's legal, legally operative, but the uh, talks are at such a sensitive stage, he said, uh, perhaps the less said, the better at this point. Uh, well, uh, the Prime Minister says that the EU wants Northern Ireland to remain in the customs union and single market if trade negotiations fail. And the DUP has accused Mrs May of breaking a promise that she would never sign up to a Brexit deal that treats Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. In the last hour, the pro-Remain Conservative MP and former Attorney General Dominic Grieve has been speaking to our Northern Ireland political correspondent Gareth Gordon on this issue of avoiding an Irish border post-Brexit. I don't think the Prime Minister is wedded to a border down the Irish Sea, but I think the Prime Minister is unable to give reassurance to the DUP that such a thing could not happen. If we leave the EU, initially, the Prime Minister's plan is we're going to stay in a customs union structure of some form, which means that actually the entirety of the United Kingdom will be in conformity with most EU rules. But should there ever come a time when a government in the UK wants to diverge, which is of course the very thing that most of the hard Brexiters want to do, then the position of the EU is that Northern Ireland would almost certainly be carved out of the economic area of the United Kingdom and they are insisting on a backstop which keeps Northern Ireland in with the EU's structures. And the Prime Minister at the moment is not able to provide an assurance to the DUP that this wouldn't happen. So I interpret this exchange of letters as the DUP indicating that in such circumstances they wouldn't support the Prime Minister's deal. I mean, regulatory checks, some regulatory checks on goods coming from GB to Northern Ireland. <clears throat> is that such a bad thing? Does that mean that Northern Ireland really is constitutionally apart from the rest of the UK? It's all a matter of degree. I mean, at the moment, there are phytosanitary uh, checks because very sensibly Ireland and mainland Great Britain operate a different system because you can keep out uh, illnesses and diseases which may be transmitted in, in cattle, for example. So it's a very sensible arrangement. But once you start saying that you are going to have a different regulatory regime, which could include tariffs, uh, could also include all sorts of regulatory elements, then you would have to have essentially a hard border in the Irish Sea. And I don't see that compatible with Northern Ireland's status within the United Kingdom. To that extent, I understand the DUP's position entirely. And the interesting thing is that I think at Westminster, it's very likely that you will find a very large number of Conservative members of Parliament and indeed members of other political parties who would refuse as a matter of principle to sign up to such an arrangement. So the phrase that we use about the DUP being thrown under a bus, there is a history of the Conservative Party, we would say, doing that to unionists. You don't think that's a danger at the moment? No, I don't think the DUP is about to find itself without a, a support at Westminster on this issue. But of course, the whole issue highlights the mess into which we've now got ourselves over Brexit. I'm a Remainer. All this, to my mind, was very predictable. We failed to think through the implications of Brexit and the details of how it would be carried out. And we failed very badly in 2016 to have a proper debate about the position of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom, particularly in the light of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, which clearly provides obligations for the United Kingdom 
and the government of Ireland to try to ensure that there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Dominic Grieve. The British Prime Minister is facing anger from Brexiteers within her party and from the DUP about reports that an EU plan to put a customs border in the Irish Sea could be included in a Brexit deal. The report comes from a leaked letter sent from Theresa May to the DUP, a meeting of the British Irish Council which the Taoiseach and senior members of the British Cabinet are attending is taking place in the Isle of Man. Well, our London correspondent Fiona Mitchell is there and joins us now. Fiona, what is in this leaked letter and why are the DUP so concerned about it? Yes, well, the DUP have been angered by this letter, which they feel is a move away from the promise that they got from Theresa May, because in this letter, uh, she refers to the fact that uh, the EU is pushing for a customs border down the Irish Sea. Uh, this is what has been referred to as a backstop to the Irish backstop. Uh, now, in the letter, she says, uh, she reiterates that this could not be enforced, but the DUP has read that phrase, could not be enforced, to mean that it could be included within any Brexit agreement and that a Brexit agreement is expected now potentially within days. So they are angered by this. This is essentially a move away from what they feel that they have agreed with Theresa May. They'll be looking for further explanation from her on that. Already this morning we've heard angry comments from Sammy Wilson, the DUP's Brexit spokesperson, who said that the DUP would not be prepared to support Theresa May's government in the event of the inclusion of this phrase in any Brexit agreement because remember of course the DUP is crucial to Theresa May it is their 10 seats and their 10 votes which keep her government in power now she will already face huge difficulties at getting any Brexit agreement through the House of Commons uh, so she needs those 10 votes to keep her government in place and to get any agreement through the Commons now, Martina, you're at that British-Irish Council meeting where Brexit will dominate the proceedings there today, no doubt. What are the wider consequences of this? Yes, well, obviously, Brexit has dominated uh, these Br British-Irish Council meetings um, since that vote uh, two years ago. It continued today. There were a lot of questions asked uh, to the leaders who were in attendance here, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, and also a Cabinet Office Minister David Liddington. All of them asked about Brexit in general and specifically that leaked letter in the Times this morning. We can have a listen now uh, to what the Taoiseach had to say. The most important thing for me is the objective, uh, and that is to uh, give everyone uh, in Northern Ireland and Ireland the uh, assurance that a hard border will not develop between North and South, no matter what else uh, may happen in, in the years ahead. Uh, and that is why we're seeking one that is legally operative uh, and one that uh, gives us that guarantee that is necessary. Uh, I think we are at a sensitive point in the negotiations. Um, a successful outcome is not guaranteed, uh, but uh, I think it is possible in the next couple of weeks, and probably with that in mind, uh, the less said the better about the, the detail of that. So as the uh, Taoiseach outlined this morning, there will be no clean break in this Brexit. He said it has a long way to go yet. But obviously there is some movement expected in the coming days. There's been speculation that there could be a special cabinet meeting over the weekend. We now expect that the earliest that would happen would be Monday or Tuesday uh, to discuss any Brexit agreement. But obviously this situation with the DUP has also now changed the British political situation. Theresa May, as I say, will come under great pressure to explain to the DUP precisely what she means in that letter. All right, Fiona Mitchell, thank you. Well, as Fiona said, the DUP MP Sammy Wilson has accused the British Prime Minister of breaking her promise on Brexit to his party. Well, for more on all of this, we're joined by our Northern Editor Tommy Gorman and our political correspondent Martina Fitzgerald. First to you, Martina, we heard the Taoiseach there in the Isle of Man. How is all of this going down here in Dublin?
Well, there really has been radio silence, very little political reaction to the developments of the last 24 hours, and possibly for two reasons. The Fianna Fáil leader, Michal Martin, recently advocated against microphone diplomacy at such a critical stage, and the Labour leader, Brendan Howland, has echoed that today. They know the talks are at a really important uh, stage. Secondly, I suppose in some ways many people here don't see all that much having changed since last December. Why? Because if you look at Theresa May's letter in detail, first of all, it seems to be that the EU is backing the Irish government's position in relation to the backstop, and Theresa May and Downing Street have let it be known that they don't want to have two custom territories within the United Kingdom, and that is a commitment that was also given last December, and there has always been this contradiction in last December's agreement, so it's restating that. However, there's one big difference, the timing. We are now one year on and at a critical point in these talks, and it's going to be very difficult to overcome that contradiction in a legal agreement. Okay, Tommy, we heard uh, Sammy Wilson there accusing Theresa May of breaking her promises. What is the significance of those comments? And the significance of what has happened in the last 24 hours is I suppose the challenge facing Theresa May is laid bare uh, and the possibility of people like the DUP, also the hard Brexiteers in her own party, and as well as that, Scottish Conservatives who would see this as the slippery slope, a special deal for Northern Ireland as part of the negotiation, where would that leave them? The SNP in Scotland would be on the case of the Scottish Conservatives. And really, Eileen, let's look at what's at stake here. This is what Theresa May describes as the insurance policy that no one wants to or expects to cash in or to call in. But it is the backstop, the bulletproof backstop, that Leo Varadkar referred to. It is also for the DUP a challenge to their view that Northern Ireland might be treated diff differently. Because if you did have even the mention of a border in the Irish Sea in the case of a no-deal scenario, that for the DUP would represent defeat. Theresa May is gathering her forces, trying to get her deal through her cabinet as early as next week. Some of her cabinet members may resign. So now you see, gathering their forces, the DUP, who are keeping her in power, the hard Brexiteers, and possibly the Scottish Conservatives as well. And this is building up to be the row that is inevitable within the Conservative Party, and the DUP is st saying quite publicly where it stands. Sammy Wilson signalling that Theresa May is threatening to break her promise. So watch for developments over the next 24 to 48 hours. This is the row that's inevitable within the Conservative Party. And in our later bulletins, I hope that we will have some news from Arlene Foster about her position. Eileen. Okay, Tommy Gorman and Martina Fitzgerald, thank you both. Now, Theresa May's allies in the Democratic Unionist Party have accused her of breaking a promise that she'd never sign up to a Brexit deal that treats Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. The DUP says a letter from the Prime Minister indicates she would be prepared to agree to Northern Ireland remaining within EU single market regulations. The Chancellor, Philip Hammond, has insisted the government won't do anything that would threaten the union. Our political correspondent, Ian Watson, reports. This is what both the EU and the UK want to avoid, a return to a troubled past with a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. But how to keep the border free-flowing after Brexit is proving difficult. The EU wants Northern Ireland to continue to follow their rules on customs and on some goods until a wider trade deal is struck. But the government and DUP say this would effectively create a new border in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. This week, the Prime Minister sent a letter to the DUP's leader, apparently to reassure her that this won't come into force. But the DUP say that isn't enough of a guarantee. They want the Prime Minister explicitly to rule this option out in any Brexit agreement she reaches with the EU. We want to trust the Prime Minister because she has said so many times that that is the case. But, but you have to judge any promise by what is actually delivered uh, in an agreement. And from what we can see in the letter, it is quite clear that some of the promises which are made do not 
conform to some of the content of the letter which has been written. All this is really about one of the most precious and rare commodities in politics, trust. The DUP simply won't take verbal or even written assurances from the government. Instead, they want to ensure that there's no mention of treating Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK after Brexit in the official text of the withdrawal agreement that the government reaches with the EU. So, can ministers guarantee that? We'll just listen very closely to how the Chancellor answered that question. Prime Minister has been very clear about this many, many times. Uh, we will not do anything which puts our union at risk. So it won't be in the withdrawal agreement? We're not going to do anything that will put the union at risk. The Prime Minister insists it would be the UK as a whole, not just Northern Ireland, that would sign up to any temporary agreement. But some of her own Cabinet members want certainty on when this would end. <laughs> Theresa May with her Belgian counterpart today. These solemn images from the armistice commemorations underline the closeness of cross-channel relationships in the past. But even if the Prime Minister finds contemporary allies in the Brexit negotiations, she could still be facing difficulties on the home front. Ian Watson, BBC News. In a moment, uh, we can talk to our island correspondent, Chris Page, who's there for us in Belfast. But first, let's go back to Ian for us at Westminster. I just wanted to pick up that point you made about trust, Ian, in the piece that we've just seen. If there is a slight lack of trust on either side, how can that be repaired, do you think? Well, it's something which uh, the Prime Minister, I think, would need to try to repair, but uh, whether that is possible uh, remains to be seen. Certainly from the DUP's point of view, what they would like to see is she's tried to negotiate an EU withdrawal, uh, a draft EU uh, withdrawal agreement, which she can then take to Brussels, hopefully have a special summit this month, get it signed off. They would want to see in the text of that document a commitment not to treat Northern Ireland any differently. However, these negotiations, as we know, have not necessarily gone smoothly. They're trying to find a way around this problem. So what effectively she has managed to convey to uh, the European Union is that it's politically impossible to have a, a de facto border down the Irish Sea. So the whole of the UK, not just Northern Ireland, would have to stay in some kind of temporary arrangement beyond Brexit if a trade deal takes a, a lot longer to negotiate. So that's where the EU are. But what they want in return for that is an absolute guarantee of no hard border in Northern Ireland. And if you start to unpick all of that, the fear by people in the DUP, but also in Theresa May's own cabinet, is that there might be, although the outcome would look the same, or everything would seem much the same, whether you're in London or Londonderry, wherever, Nonetheless, it may well be that Northern Ireland is actually governed by different rules, different regulations when it comes to the single market, possibly the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. So they really want to see this document in black and white, and they also want to see the legal advice that's underpinning it. If she cannot do that, then she is in potential trouble further down the line, because even if she gets a deal through Cabinet, even if she gets a deal with the European Union, she still has to get it through Parliament. And of course, the 10 DUP votes could be crucial in a very, very tight vote where the Labour Party, or most of them, are likely to oppose this. So unless she wins the DUP over, the consequences are that they may well withdraw support. So it's a difficult task for her, but what they may be asking when you're trying to get some kind of compromise, or as some critics might call it, some kind of fudge to get this deal over the line, what they're asking might be too much for her to deliver. Ian, thank you very much for that. Ian Watson there at Westminster. So let's go to Belfast. There's Chris Page for us. How does it look, uh, all this, where you are, Chris? Well, the DUP are clearly upping the ante as the Brexit talks move into a most sensitive phase. In terms of what the DUP are most worried about, well, it is all about this issue as to whether there's the potential for Northern Ireland to continue to follow European rules for goods. It's not about customs. The government, uh, the Prime Minister, in her letter to the uh, Democratic Unionist Party that was leaked, said there wouldn't be two customs territories within the UK. In other words, Northern Ireland would remain under the same customs regime as England, Scotland and Wales. But then that leaves open the issue of the European single market. How would it operate if the land border with the Irish Republic is kept open as it is at the moment? In that letter, Theresa May said, well, look, there are 
uh, there is a single electricity market on the island of Ireland. There are also some checks on animals as they move between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. So the implication of stating that, you would think, would be that there'd be an argument. If those arrangements aren't particularly controversial, well, perhaps we could look at other similar uh, arrangements to get round these Brexit problems, and that wouldn't amount to a constitutional crisis for Northern Ireland. The Democratic Unionist Party don't see things that way. Their main problem, the main argument they've been putting forward today, is that if Northern Ireland continues to follow EU rules on the movement of goods, then those rules will be set in Brussels and not London, and therefore Northern Ireland won't have any control, any influence over how those rules are set. So to them, it is a breakup of the union, they say. So you can certainly expect the DUP to try to keep up the pressure on Theresa May over the coming days, but I also think you can expect them to be talking to Tory backbenchers. They may be thinking if they don't get their way uh, with the Prime Minister, or well, then maybe their next best option would be to try to make an impact whenever any deal comes before the House of Commons. Uh, and Chris, a word beyond the DUP, because clearly we're concentrating on them because of their connections to the Conservatives at Westminster. But when you look across uh, all the other parties in Northern Ireland, how does the picture look then? Well, the DUP passionately campaigned for the UK to leave the European Union. They were the only one of the five main parties in Northern Ireland to do so. So really you have most of the other main parties setting themselves against uh, the DUP and you have most of the main parties strongly critical actually of the DUP's uh, arrangement with the, the Conservative Party at Westminster. Sinn Féin, for example, the second biggest party in Northern Ireland, the biggest nationalist party, will argue that it is that relationship between the DUP uh, and the Conservatives which has played a major role in the fact that there's been no devolved government here now for nearly two years. They say the government can't uh, really put it up to the DUP, that the DUP have too big an influence on the government and that the DUP are basically happy enough with the way uh, things are going. If there's no storm, well, they're in a position of influence in Westminster. The DUP, of course, will totally deny that. They'll say that that deal they have with the Conservatives has brought lots of extra money to Northern Ireland, uh, a billion pounds of extra spending. And they'll also say it's important that they're in that position uh, in Westminster so that they can get the best deal for Northern Ireland out of the Brexit negotiations. Now, most people here in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU, 56%. So, again, the political opponents of the DUP will make that point often. But uh, the DUP, certainly one way or another, are making their influence felt. They're at the parliamentary pivot point. It's their 10 MPs that the government relies on for vital votes. And you can expect them to try to press that influence to the maximum. Uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Chris Page there in Belfast. Before we take you there. Let's get more now on the DUP, which has accused the Prime Minister of breaking promises over plans to avoid a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic post-Brexit. Meanwhile, the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, is insisting the government won't do anything that puts the union at risk. We can get the thoughts of Robin Swan, who's leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. The UUP currently holds 10 seats in the Northern Irish Assembly, but lost both its seats at Westminster at the 2017 election. Robin Swan, good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you had Arlene Foster's position of, of power at the moment, would you be doing anything differently? I think we would at this minute in time because what we actually should be doing in this is actually supporting the Prime Minister to get the deal that doesn't bring the backstop into play. So it would be more important, important to us about actually strengthening the British government's hand at this minute in time in its negotiations with the EU to ensure that we get that comprehensive deal that doesn't bring about the necessity of the backstop that actually we agree with the DUP as will be a, a threat to the union. Right, I mean, that, that's where I was about to go because I assumed that you and the DUP were in the same place in terms of, of what you ultimately want to see happen here. Yes, well, look, we're, we're both unionist parties, so our, our main aim is to ensure Northern Ireland's position is a, an integral part of the United Kingdom. And anything that comes out of the backstop that weakens our position as that integral part of the United Kingdom is something that we wouldn't support either. So even about, you know, the talk about bringing in different regula regulatory checks uh, on products coming from GB to Northern Ireland is something that we couldn't stand over. Uh, what then of the developments in the last 24 hours, uh, the leaked letter, the comments of Philip Hammond, I made reference to them a moment ago, the comments of the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, says these worries, you know, this simply will not happen. What do you take out of all that? Well, look, there's one thing I've learned in Northern Ireland politics is, is when leaked, leaked anything, leaked letters, leaked emails start to come out, they're leaked for a reason they're, and they're leaked for somebody trying to get... A, a position of strength over someone else. I actually think we're looking at a position now where the Prime Minister is actually putting it up to the DUP and that's where I think she is saying 
come into Westminster and support the deal that I'm putting on the table, or the option is is actually the backstop, the thing that you're actually arguing against. So I, I think we're at a crucial point in the negotiations. I think we're at a, actually at a crucial point as to where the United Kingdom accept what the Prime Minister is going to put on the table come, I think, next week to actually see what a progressive deal or what a deal could look like between the EU and the UK. Thank you very much for coming on, um, Robin Swan there, of the UUP. Now, just a reminder that we will take you to northern France in a moment, uh, where President Macron and Theresa May are due to appear at Tiepval fairly shortly. This, of course, uh, in the light of the events there commemorating the end, uh, the 100th anniversary of the end of First World War. But uh, as you can see, alongside me is Jamie Robertson as we're talking about uh, the business. Well, we can speak now to Sammy Wilson. You saw him in that film a moment ago, the DUP's Brexit spokesman. He's on the line from Larne in County Antrim. Sammy Wilson, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, perhaps I can go back to that word that Ian uh, used in that piece, namely trust. Do you not trust the Prime Minister over this? Well, I think that the, the difficulty is this, that the Prime Minister is being asked to sign a document which will be an international treaty, legally binding, and part of that document, as we understand it at present, will have a backstop which refers specifically to Northern Ireland and which, as she has said in her letter, will, will, in, will require Northern Ireland to be treated as different from the rest of the United Kingdom because regulations about trade, about uh, working time directives, environment, etc., would be determined in Brussels. So, you know, it's not a case of trusting, it's a case of making sure that she doesn't sign up to something that she can't get out of. And all along we have said that, first of all, the backstop is not necessary. And secondly, she should certainly not be signing up to a legal agreement which she does not have the ability to get out of and is dependent upon the EU to release her from. Right. I mean, you say it's not about trust, but the Northern Ireland Secretary has been speaking on this subject in the last little while, Karen Bradley. She said this, quote, The Prime Minister has been absolutely clear that she's not prepared to see the breakup of the constitutional and economic integrity of the United Kingdom in any deal. Now, if that is true, and there's no reason to suggest it's not, I, I don't understand why you don't believe that. And I fear uh, we will not get an answer to that question because, sadly, ah, uh, for a moment, uh, Sammy Wilson, we lost your line and you, you, went, yeah, ominous, I, I, you went ominously so, still. Um, but by all means, come back and reply to what, what I said if you heard it. I, di I didn't actually hear it just right. as you started. Right. Right. Well, let, let me go there again. Uh, Karen Bradley said the Prime Minister has been absolutely clear that she's not prepared to see the breakup of the constitutional and economic integrity of the UK in any deal. Now, why isn't that enough for you? Because the Prime Minister is being asked to sign up to something which will last well beyond her period in office, namely a legally binding agreement with the EU, with, which forms the withdrawal agreement. And that, she, she will not have the ability to say at any stage, we no longer wish to abide by the terms of that because she signed up to it legally and uh, successive governments will be tied to that agreement as well. And what we're saying to her is if that agreement requires her to have as part of it Northern Ireland being treated differently, then she should not sign up to it. And that is the only way right. she can be sure that she can deliver on that promise. Right, but she, oh, goodness. Um, that, that's Sorry, another that, technical that, issue I wasn't anticipating. Sir. We are having technical difficulties. We, we are, here. yes. Um, one more, if I may. She said she won't sign up to it if Northern Ireland is treated differently. So why isn't that enough for you? Well, she's already said in her letter that Northern Ireland would be treated differently. She has said in her letter that, first of all, it would be Northern Ireland specific. That secondly, Northern Ireland would be required to align itself with the regulations of the European Union. Thirdly, that the assent, although the, a pro, she had made a promise on this earlier on, indeed had included this in the agreement, that the, the promise that was made that the Northern Ireland Assembly would have the final say is now removed from the letter which she has sent to us. So we've already seen that, and I imagine it's at the behest of the European Union, which has said we can't have those pesky uh, people in the Northern Ireland Assembly upsetting this deal, so you've got to take that bit out, and that bit has now been removed. And that's why we see 
the the uh, the, the letter as being one which uh, has the alarm bells ringing here. Okay, um, we'll leave it there in the interest of of the, the general good order of your your attic space. Um, but thank you very much indeed for coming on, uh, Sammy you. Wilson there of the DUP. Now let's turn to domestic politics and get more specifically on the DUP, which has accused the Prime Minister of breaking promises over plans to avoid a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic post-Brexit. The party's 10 Westminster MPs are key because Theresa May relies on their support in important votes because she doesn't have a majority in the House of Commons. Now the Prime Minister has repeatedly said that she won't accept a Brexit deal that breaks up the United Kingdom. Let's go back to Belfast. We can speak now to Martin O'Milia, who's a Brexit spokesman for Sinn Féin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Julian. You presumably share the DUP's concerns over this, don't you? No, in fact, uh, the majority of parties here uh, oppose the DUP position. You'll remember, Julian, we voted to remain in the European Union. The majority of parties in the Assembly, if it's set, uh, would also wish to remain in the European Union. The DUP is an outlier on this. And why is that? Because all the evidence shows that Brexit uh, is uh, very damaging to our peace and reconciliation process, will be disastrous for our economy, will set us back uh, in terms of the prosperity we have been creating uh, here over the last 20 years. So the DUP uh, want a Brexit at any cost to serve their narrow political interests. And it's good to see uh, the British Prime Minister return to where she was in December. That is the pledge that there will be a backstop or better uh, for the north of Ireland right. in the time ahead. Well, let's break that down because this comes out of a leaked letter. So the Prime Minister has given a pretty clear assurance that that's not necessarily where it would go. I mean, the reason I pose the initial question is that you and the DUP, uh, I know you've got different views on Brexit, but you don't want a hard border either, do you? Well, of course, and we know that the DUP, while uh, saying one thing, we know that, in fact, uh, one of their spokespersons has briefed the media that uh, build the border as high as you want. Another spokesperson said, another MLA, member of the Legislative Assembly, says what would be wrong about a hard border. And we do know that in terms of uh, going back to the past, uh, that the DUP favours policies which are, if not uh, familiar to those who, who study the 18th century, certainly they'd be familiar to those who study the years of division here because mm. the DUP policy is one which would exacerbate division uh, and this is just the latest example of it. Well, that I mean, uh, we, had, we, had Sammy Wilson, we had Sammy Wilson on earlier on. He could not have been clearer that he doesn't want a hard border. Well, if, if that's the case, uh, then he should accept what the EU27 is saying. Uh, he should accept what 21 business organisations say, the greatest in, in my... Uh, lifetime, the greatest uh, coming together of business organisations, 21 business organisations said that they required uh, to remain in the customs union and in the single market. So if Sammy Wilson accepts that, he has mm. to set aside the red, white and blue Brexit and he has to, he has to accept they're, they're the only way to avoid the return of the border and all that that means is to support the backstop. Right, but you know as full as, uh, also that when you go back to what the Prime Minister has been saying on this, uh, she has ruled out the customs union single market membership for, the North, for Northern Ireland because she's ruled it out for the whole of the United Kingdom. And the, and the wonderful thing is, of course, while she said that, she has also signed her name to a letter to Michel Barnier uh, saying that she would uh, allow uh, the north of Ireland to uh, have a backstop, which means, in fact, that it does remain in the customs union. That but we that's are, only if a deal isn't done, isn't it? No, I understand that. I, I'm only saying this is the pledge that Mrs May has made now on several occasions, that if she can't get a better deal, she will allow the north of Ireland to remain in the customs union as the EU27, as Sinn Féin, as the Irish government has demanded, and we will have full regulatory alignment with the single market, especially in relation to north-south trade. So she is saying different things. I'm pleased that in recent days the British government seems to be returning to the solemn promise they give to the EU. And if that means that we have a, a Brexit, which and I'm, I'm wholly against Brexit, but if it means we have a Brexit which is not a disaster for our economy, which make, make, ensures that we don't have a return to a hard border, then I would be pleased in the DUP. Okay. The DUP, I think, need to accept the will of the majority here. That is, that we want to continue on this road of progress, and that, it, that means we have, to re, we have to remain in the customs union and the single market. Thank you for coming on with your thoughts, you. um, Martin O'Millio there, who's uh, from Sinn Féin. Now, um, obviously, we're continuing to monitor reaction to Joe Johnson's resignation as Transport Minister, which has come through in the last 10 or 15 minutes. I'm just looking at a tweet from his uh, brother. 
Boris Johnson. And uh, he has, as he says here, boundless admiration. As ever, he says, for my brother Joe, we may not have agreed about Brexit, because the interesting element of the family dynamics here is that Boris Johnson was obviously in favour of leaving, Joe Johnson was in favour of remaining. But he goes on to say, but we are united in dismay at the intellectually and politically indefensible, um, that's how the words are written, of the UK position. This is not taking back control, it is surrender of control. It does not remotely correspond to the mandate of the people in June 2016. So Boris Johnson very much with his brother Joe uh, on his uh, resignation, despite the fact that they were on opposite sides of the actual referendum um, debate at the time. Now, still with Brexit, <clears throat> Theresa May's allies in the Democratic Unionist Party have accused her of breaking a promise that she would never sign up to a Brexit deal that treats Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK. The DUP says a letter from the Prime Minister indicates she would be prepared to agree to Northern Ireland remaining within EU single market regulations. The Chancellor, Philip Hammond, has insisted the government won't do anything that would threaten the union. Well, uh, Let's look at the issues raised in that report further. I'm joined by John Tong, who's Professor of British and Irish Politics at the University of Liverpool, as well as a frequent contributor to the Belfast Telegraph on this subject. John Tong, good afternoon. Good afternoon. As ever, this is a moving story, so I'll come to Joe Johnson in a moment, but let's stay with this issue about the border and this leaked letter and what it may or may not mean. What's your interpretation of where this debate has gone today? Well, the Prime Minister wants just to talk about a UK-wide customs territory to the DUP, but that's not good enough for the DUP because the DUP also want reassurance that there'll be a single regulatory uh, UK-wide market. In other words, there'll be no divergence, uh, no extra checks on goods going between Great Britain and Northern Ireland or from Northern Ireland to Great Britain. And the Prime Minister has studiously avoided giving that guarantee to the DUP and that's why the DUP, far from supplying confidence uh, to the government these days, are supplying trouble, because the DUP do smell difficulties here. They think that ultimately the backstop to the backstop, as it were, Northern Ireland being part of an EU single market is a live possibility. And that, that in the DUP's worldview, pushes Northern Ireland ever closer uh, to a united Ireland. It would be Northern Ireland as part of an EU protectorate, as the DUP would, would, would see it, and that's simply not acceptable for the DUP. They accuse the government of reneging on promises that there will be no regulatory divergence, no so-called border in the Irish Sea between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, all of this, we should say, is only if a deal is not done. That's right, but increasingly it appears that the, the Prime Minister and the government more broadly is prepared to align itself with the EU in terms of customs. So we, for an indefinite period, would be aligned uh, in terms of EU customs territory. But it's about much more than customs. If you want, for the DUP, the only single market that matters is the single market of the United Kingdom. That's certainly not the view of the EU in terms of managing the issue of a hard border. For the European Union, you can only have single market uh, alliances uh, across the island of Ireland. That's the only way you can properly manage the border. The issue was fudged last December with wording that was frankly contradictory. We're now in the end game. You cannot carry on fudging this. And the DUP aren't bluffing in terms of threatening to end the confidence and supply deal. And obviously the numbers potentially would be catastrophic for the government. If the DUP was to swap sides, you'd have 326 opposition MPs and 315 government MPs, so the numbers don't stack up in terms of the rest of the government's domestic legislation. You'd have a zombie government unable to pass anything. But the more that the government does soften Brexit and allies itself to an EU customs union and potentially a single market for Northern Ireland, the more the possibility is raised that they could get support from Labour, and that would obviously marginalise the DUP's 10. They'd be, work, they'd be far, far less important if there was to be cross-party support for a soft Brexit. Mm. I mean, I was about to ask you whether you, I mean, you, you raised the possibility of the DUP bluffing. Uh, I was about to suggest to you that, you know, can you really conceive of them uh, swapping uh, to the extent that they go across and effectively back Jeremy Corbyn in this? I mean, could you envisage that? They, 
have insisted that they would back the government on a vote of confidence. So if yeah. a, cr a crucial vote was lost, then they would back the government because they don't obviously want a Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour Party, that possibility. But that's, you know, you still end up with this government unable to pass any domestic legislation if the DUP was to swap sides. Theresa May mislaid her majority. Uh, her set of allies appears to be ever diminishing, as, as we've just heard. So the parliamentary arithmetic, you know, couldn't be more difficult for the government to manage. Mm. And that includes within her own party. Well, let, let's just finish with those uh, developments in the last half an hour or so. Joe Johnson resigns. Now, he's not a cabinet minister, um, but he is a, a rank below or was a rank below. Of course, the fact that he's Boris Johnson's brother, I suppose, <laughs> makes, it makes it a little more interesting. I mean, wh wh what do you take out of all of that and everything he's said? Well, I think clearly you know, he's, he's concerned that it's, it's not what people have voted for. And I think it also gives momentum to the, the idea, the ever-growing idea, of this so-called people's vote and, and a second referendum, because the government's options appear to be uh, ever-narrowing. I mean, they, they could go back and ask the European Union for an even better deal, but that seems unlikely. At the moment, the deal that's on offer doesn't pass Labour's so-called six tests, so it's unlikely to get through Parliament. And that means, what can Theresa May do? She can call an election... But that's obviously high risk, or you can put it, uh, you can put the issue back to the people. So I think again the dynamics have changed with Joe Johnson's resignation. The Prime Minister appears even more beleaguered this afternoon than she was only 24 hours ago. Good to have your thoughts, John. Thank you very much, uh, John Tong, there in Liverpool. You're watching Afternoon Live, and these are the latest headlines. Our economics and business editor John Campbell is with me. The DUP just won't support proposals like this on a border. There's certainly more trouble for the Prime Minister this evening. Yeah, um, tonight she has lost her Transport Minister, uh, Joe Johnson. He's a, a brother of Boris Johnson. He's resigned, saying that it's clear to him that the sort of deal that the Prime Minister is aiming for would be bad for the whole of the UK. Now, his position is, is very different from that of the DUP. He's a, a Remain supporter. He thinks that there should be another referendum. But as it stands, he wouldn't vote for the sort of deal Theresa May is going for. The 10 DUP MPs wouldn't vote for it. You'd have probably many other Conservatives wouldn't vote for it. And as a matter of policy, the Labour Party wouldn't vote for it. So the problem for Theresa May is that things move on. The question keeps arising, where are her numbers? Where are the votes that she actually needs to get any deal through Parliament? Well, is there any way she can square the circle, keep the DUP on side and have a backstop that is acceptable to the European Union? Well, one thing that she suggests in her letter to the DUP is if the, the backstop arrangement was going, only going to last for a short period of time, you would have Northern Ireland being required to follow some EU rules, but the rest of the UK would voluntarily follow those rules. So therefore, you would have no need for Irish sea checks. But again, that raises the questions of who would support that, because certainly Brexit true believers in her party would say, hold on a moment, you're proposing not only would we stay in the customs union, we would also continue to follow EU rules. That's not Brexit. So once again, the, the question arises, where are the numbers to support that? And where does this leave the prospect of the UK and EU striking a deal? Negotiations continue in, in Brussels this weekend. The, the Taoiseach speaking today says he still thinks that a deal can be done within the next few weeks. But that's a deal between the EU and the UK. What we're talking about is can a deal be done between Theresa May, the DUP and the rest of her party? John, thank you.